So let's decide how this Grignard would react with this reagent over here. We want to decide how this Grignard would react with this reagent. Um, so uh, I'll look over your shoulder for a second, but if you get stuck, we can go through this again. Try to draw the mechanism for what would happen here. Okay, let's go through this together. Looks like you guys might have been on the right track. All right, so uh, in this case, I've already drawn this as ionic. So the very first thing you should have done was put the negative charge at the tail. So we can start by that. And then the question becomes, who should go at the head? Uh, will you guys tell me who should go at the head here? Um, I put hydrogen. Yeah, the hydrogen here will go at the head. And this doesn't matter what hydrogen you choose, right? The water? That's right, these two hydrogens are equivalent. But you need to rewrite this with one hydrogen sticking out so we can show the mechanism. Why is it reasonable for this carbon to be at the tail? Because the tail has a full negative charge. So by the same logic, why is it reasonable for this hydrogen to be at the head? A delta positive. This hydrogen has a delta positive. So again, try to get into the habit of trying to rationalize electron pushing arrows in terms of charges, full charges or partial charges. You always need to be able to rationalize it in some way. OK, well, hydrogen can only bond to one thing at a time. So if the hydrogen is bonding to this carbon, that means it's going to have to break the bond to this oxygen uh, over here. Uh, maybe uh, I'll show the, the pairs of electrons that are moving, even though that's not really necessary technically. OK, um, now I'm going to draw the product. And to help me draw this product, I'm going to use uh, numbering. One, two, and three carbons. These are not IUPAC numbers, these are just reference numbers. All right, so let's start with this compound here. So I'll start with the number one carbon. Who's the number one carbon attached to? Uh, number two. Number one's attached to number two. And who's the number two attached to? And who's the number three attached to? A new hydrogen. And that's the end of the chain, because we're breaking this bond over here. Now, actually, here's the, where the pair of electrons has moved into. Now, it would be perfectly fine if you didn't actually draw this hydrogen, because we don't usually draw hidden hydrogen. So, we just not have the negative symbol anymore? Ah, uh, yeah, we should also think about the charges here. So, remember that in any step of any reaction, you always change two charges at the initial tail and the final head. Well, here this carbon is at the initial tail, um, and it's losing electrons starting with negative, so it should end up neutral. That's right. So if you wanted to, eventually people kind of just draw this like this. Eventually people just draw it like this. They just say there's a negative charge here, and then this is neutral. But I think for a beginning student, it's really much better to draw it like this, because then you can really see what's happening. So this would be for credit, but for the next few weeks, we should try drawing things like this, like this, so we can actually see the reaction that's happening. Now, I'm not going to bother showing the other two hidden hydrogens on this number three carbon, because they're not doing anything that's interesting. But I'm going to show this hidden hydrogen, because it was participating in the reaction. Maybe after you draw this, you might want to simplify by redrawing it like this. But this is a good step for a beginning student. OK. Uh, all right. So that gives us that. Um, and now we have to go to uh, this over here, where we know the oxygen's not attached um, to this hydrogen anymore. So we just get this oxygen here. Now this oxygen is the final head. It started neutral and it gained electrons. So it ends up negative. We always change two charges. All right, and now we also have to deal with the ionic bonds. When you're working with electron pushing arrows, how do you know when to break an ionic bond? Well, whenever an atom loses its charge, you have to break its, ion its ionic bond, because ionic bonds are based on charges, right? So if you notice that an atom is losing a charge, you have to break its ionic bonds, if it has some. So we're going to have to break this ionic bond over here. And how do you know when to form ionic bonds when you're using electron pushing arrows? Well, you form the bonds with atoms that have formed new charges. So the carbon lost the charge, but this oxygen over here gained the charge. So we can form a new ionic bond with this oxygen over here. So the most elegant way to draw this now
The best way to draw this now is like this. With a new ionic bond uh, between the, count, the spectator ion and the new atom with the charge. Will they mark off points if you don't show that? Probably not. Okay. Uh, I'm mainly explaining this because you'll see this in the answers. Um, again, we don't really care much about the magnesium bromide. Uh, there actually might be some problems where it's, it's useful to show what happens to the magnesium yeah. bromide. So you might as well get into the habit of showing that. In some reactions, they'll show, right. like, and even other reactions, like Br minus is coming on. Right. They'll show Br minus, and then other times they won't. So I right. Don't know. Yeah, so it kind of depends on the whim of the person that's writing it. Again, for a beginning student, though, it's best to do this because it means that we're keeping track of all the reagents. Okay, um, so we show that here. So again, um, we already know when to break a covalent bond with electron pushing arrows. You only break a covalent bond with electron pushing arrows if there's the tail of an arrow coming from one. We have that here. We broke this covalent bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen because there was the tail of an arrow coming from this covalent bond. So the arrows tell you which covalent bonds to break. The arrows tell you which covalent bonds to break. Uh, we broke this covalent bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. You have to break any covalent bond that's at the tail of an arrow. Make sure, I'm going to use these terms a lot, so make sure you guys are all comfortable with the idea that this is the tail end of the arrow and this is the head end of the arrow over here. So you break a covalent bond when the tail of the arrow is on it. Okay? Um, and those are the only covalent bonds you can break. A very common mistake is to break covalent bonds that are not at a tail. Don't break any covalent bonds that are not at a tail. And also, you should only form a covalent bond if that's indicated by the head of an arrow. For example, here, um, this head of this arrow was indicating we were forming a covalent bond between the carbon and the hydrogen, so we formed that over here. So, how do you know which, uh, which covalent bonds to form and which covalent bonds to break? The electron pushing arrows tell you. The electron pushing arrows tell you what to do with the covalent bonds. Make sure you don't do anything that's not dictated by an electron pushing arrow. That's a common mistake. But how do you know which ionic bonds to break and which ionic bonds to form? Well, the electron pushing arrows don't tell you that. You have to just watch the charges. If an atom is losing its charge, it has to lose its ionic bond. And if an atom is gaining a charge, it can gain a new ionic bond. Notice that in a sense, again, we don't really draw ionic bonds except by showing the two charges close to each other. If we show two charges close to each other, that's an implied ionic bond. Okay. Uh, in solution, many of these, in solution, this might not be realistic. In solution, oftentimes these are actually separate ions floating around, but it's still conventional to draw it as if it was an ionic bond. This is the conventional way to show this. Okay. Uh, so we've gone through the reaction uh, that we would have here. Um, so uh, again, the, the interesting product is this one. This is the interesting product here. What we care about are the carbon-containing products. So this is the interesting product here. Notice again that the, uh, the bromine certainly did nothing, right, except maybe confuse us. So the bromine is not participating in the reaction. Uh, OK, now, um, how did this atom behave then here in this reaction? Did it act as a nucleophile or as a base? Well, What's the bronsted lowery definition of a base? Water, so yeah. it's a base. Remember that a base is somebody who steals a proton. A base is somebody who steals a proton. So this is actually a case where we used a Grignard as a base. This is an example of using a Grignard as a base to deprotonate somebody else. We used the Grignard as a base to deprotonate somebody. I said earlier that Grignards can be nucleophiles, but now we can see they can also be bases. That shouldn't surprise us because many good nucleophiles are also good bases. You can see that from the handout. Many of the things that are good nucleophiles in the handout are also good bases. So that's the case here. This could either be a nucleophile or a base. Okay. Um, it's not a nucleophile because remember, what does a nucleophile do? It actually joins the substrate that it's attacking. But the Grignard here didn't join the water. It just stole the proton from it. That's the basic difference between a nucleophile and a base. So if that was like, for example, and I don't think you can have like, if it was BROH, and, right. it, and so then the nucleophile would go and attach that and then get rid of the BR, and that would be acting as a nucleophile? Uh, let's see. Like a, I mean, I know BROH is just like... Um, yeah, that's right. Actually, let's not go down that path with that okay. example yet. I think as we do more examples with grid yards, it'll clarify how to work with it. So we should probably just stick with the examples, and then I think we'll see how to work with them. Okay, but again, um, the difference between a nucleophile and a base is a nucleophile is somebody who donates electrons in order to join a substrate, whereas a base is somebody who donates electrons in order to steal a proton 
Well, that's what was happening here. It was donating electrons to steal the proton, not to join the substrate. The substrate's just the molecule you're attacking. Okay. So now we've seen that Grignards can act as either bases or nucleophiles. 